All right. So this week we have uh, Dr. Jen Shope from Indiana University International Networks, and she is going to be talking about uh, an NSF-funded project to develop uh, some measurement and monitoring code and it's called NetSage, and I will turn it over to you, Jen. Great, thanks, Jason. Um, so I think some of you have probably heard us talk about NetSage before. Um, we were funded, hang on, there you go. We were funded a few years ago uh, by NSF to work with measurement and monitoring in the international space. I'm gonna give a really short overview, and then I'm gonna walk through an example that we used with the N-Wave folks. Um, and the kind of problems that we find in that example, we actually find all the time in random other examples. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the additional capabilities that aren't related to that particular one in terms of archiving and SNMP work. So NetSage offers a measurement service for, uh, service for RNA data traffic. Um, the goal of it was to try to understand what was going on on the international circuits because unlike every other large scale facility that NSF funds, it was really difficult to understand who was using it and uh, for how, um, what kind of science was going over these links and, and how, uh, what the capacity uh, use was. So we were funded about four years ago, a collaboration between myself, uh, LBL at the time, it was Brian Tierney and Sean Piercer, now Andy Lake is the co-PI, and University of Hawaii Manoa, uh, specifically Jason Lee and his visualization group. Um, this was originally funded to look at the international links, um, but it's now been deployed domestically in part through the Engagement and Performance Operations Center. Um, the link that is on the bottom here is for the international links. I've got links throughout this uh, uh, talk and in the slide notes, there are actually links to specific dashboards as well. Um, Jason's going to make the slides available to everybody. So one of the ways that NetSage is a little bit different than a lot of other measurement tools is we really tried to focus on use cases and what were the questions that people would be asking of the data. We weren't just trying to come up with cool, shiny visualizations. We were trying to actually answer questions. So the first ones were, oh, how are the links being used? You know, where are the congestion points? And then when we started pulling in flow data, we were like, okay, well, what are the top sites using my circuits? Uh, what are the top sources and destinations? Who's using my archive? Um, and now we've gotten to a point where we can ask uh, performance debugging questions. Um, you know, what are the flows between two different organizations? What kind of behaviors are they seeing? We pull in data from a number of different data sources, starting with SNMP, which everybody pretty much out there has and shares. We have dashboards using persona or active tests. We use flow data from routers, which gets de-identified before it gets in our archive. We're also using a tool called TSTAT, which pulls in uh, TCP flow statistics passively as well. Um, so it's basically flow data plus um, retransmits and a little bit more data. We're currently only using that on archives uh, because it has challenges, as do many of these tools, with asymmetric pass. And especially in the international space, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the pass are asymmetric. So, uh, but when you can put this piece of software on a, a node for an archive, you can actually, you, you don't have to deal with that problem. So we've got two domestic deployments supported by EPIC. One is uh, with the Great Plains Network. That was our first guinea pig, and that's an SNMP deployment, which I'll talk about way at the end. Um, and the second one is a flow data deployment with iLight and the Indiana Gigapop. Um, internationally, where we started, we've now got collection points in New York, Miami, Seattle, Honolulu, and Guam. So a tool like this is only as good as the collection points you have. So for example, there are currently nine different links between the US and Europe. Um, we only have information on the one that's NSF funded that goes from New York to London. Um, so I'm gonna start with iLight and talk a little bit about some of the ways that that's been used. So we uh, brought this up in April um, in time to show some data at their members meeting in May. We're gathering data from five different routers supported by iLight and the Indiana Gigapop. Um, for them, we're only collecting flows over 100 meg. So the smaller flows are mostly emails and web page acts and such, and that's not the kind of traffic we're interested in. So we're only collecting these slightly larger flows, although 100 meg still isn't very large. Um, here is an example of uh, if you go to iLight, 
www.netsage.global. You'll get to this page, which is the top senders and top receivers. Um, the top talkers is the basic part of flow data that people seem to ask. Um, no surprises here, Indiana University, University of Chicago, Purdue. Um, below that, you see we also have the rate. All of this could be live. I'm terrified of doing live demos, so it's all screenshots. Um, under, we've got top senders and top receivers, and then we have the top pairs. So these uh, may or may not line up with the top senders and receivers, but I can give you some data about how um, the interactions are between the two institutions on a particular link. So you can navigate around this. You can change the time frame in the top right. For flow data, if you go above about 90 days, it'll be a little bit slow. Um, depending on your connection and how many other people are, are queuing this, it also may uh, 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 be uh, delayed. Um, you can change the dashboard either with this uh, link here or there's now a, a spinny S that shows up in the top right. Um, so you can uh, go around that way. What I wanted to do is walk through an example. Um, I did this at the N-Wave meeting in July. They'd asked me to come out and talk to them a little bit about how we were using NetSage. And so I think it was uh, lunch the day before my talk the next morning. I said, OK, well, let's walk through. And, and who should I be using as my guinea pig? Uh, one of the interesting things about NOAA is uh, they map their AS numbers. So their blocks of IPs get mapped to a lot of different AS numbers, um, some which are labeled non-intuitively. NetSage uses the WHOIS database to map um, from an IP address to uh, an organization name, and then the IP address gets thrown out before it gets put in our archive. So sometimes the naming can be a bit odd. So for example, knowing Boulder, which is where this meeting was, uh, the AS is actually NIST US Department of Commerce um, for historical reasons. So uh, we wanted to say, okay, who is sharing data over the iLight network with Noah and Boulder? And we got this list four terabytes from Purdue. That surprised them. Um, so this is from the Noah Boulder uh, site to a site in Indiana. Um, they did not know that Purdue would have accessed four terabytes of data in the last month. Um, this shows the senders to Boulder, Noah. Um, and this is not surprising because most of the data from those sites, NOAA, NCAR, et cetera, are, are poll sites, so that you, didn't, you would not expect much data to be going the other way. Um, if you scroll down on this page, you also get this information. Uh, the interesting thing here for the NOAA folks was specifically under top source ports. Sorry, I'm pointing because the screen is in front of me. Um, on top source ports, 388 is their um, the protocol for, or the port used by their data transfer protocol, specifically that, that uh, much of the NOAA and NCAR data is accessed by. So that was of interest to them. Um, so I can show you this data also for the international links, which you know we've only been collecting the Indiana data since uh, mid-April. We've been collecting the international data for a couple years now in different sites. Again, all of these red stars are where our collection points are. So. Any data that I see has to go through one of those red stars, okay? So I said, okay, over the international links, here's who is pulling data from the Boulder archive, or from the, the Boulder site. And these are sites that we would expect. Academica Sinica is a large institution in Taiwan, as is the National Center for Research and Earthquake Engineering. Um, the number two, three, and four are all in South America. Again, a lot of uh, climate research going on there. University of Hawaii, everyone would expect to see again. Um, there's a strong collaboration between those two. Um, for data going in, University of Hawaii actually has a NOAA site at it, so they, they were not surprised to see that. Um, so that was NOAA Boulder. It was suggested to me to also look at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, which was in Princeton. Um, so we ran those data. That, uh, query here, and we were surprised to see that two terabytes over the last 30 days went to Chonbuk National University. It's a university in South Korea that is well known for its environmental research programs and environmental engineering programs, but still they didn't know that there was such a, a strong collaboration or such a strong need for data for them. So we decided to look at that in a little bit more detail and pulled up one of our newer um, uh, dashboards, which lets me look at individual flows. So if you notice in the top left 
It says individual flows now. I set the source to GFDL and my destination to Chumbuk National University. I'm still looking at the last 30 days. And this is the dashboard that it shows me, right? So I've got the timestamp, my source and destination, the total volume, the rate. Um, the retransmits data and round trip time is actually um, this dashboard shows data both for flow data from links and uh, TSAT from archives. So if we had our data from an archive, um, those numbers would be filled in. So this is kind of interesting, right? We can look at this. But if you scroll down on this dashboard, you'll actually see a couple heat maps. There's one by volume and there's one by rate. So if you look at those, you kind of see also there's three different kind of highlighted spaces. There's one kind of here, there's one kind of here, and then there was one that was happening just as I was at NOAA over here. This is interesting. This uh, says to me that someone is doing sporadic data transfers every 10 days, two weeks. This is a reoccurring pattern. This is kind of an interesting data transfer that's happening between these two institutions. So the next question we had is, okay, well, what path is this going over? Because something going to South Korea, I would have actually expected it to use the Chicago South Korea direct path and not go through one of the Iron Sea links. So because this is going to Korea, I would hope that this is either going through Seattle on the path between Seattle and Tokyo and then through Asia from there, um, which is a hundred gig path. It might be going through Hong Kong um, because there's a, Hong Kong has two 10Gs between Guam and Hong Kong and, and up Asia that way. But we would have expected this to take the 100 gig path from uh, Seattle if it was going over an NSF funded link at all. So we pulled up that data and found out, no, we're wrong. No flows. So when we pulled up the Hong Kong data, there were all of the flows uh, that, I, that we had seen before between these two institutions. Um, so this was a bit surprising, and I was, as I mentioned, working on this during the meeting, as you do before you give a talk. And uh, so I turned to uh, Jason, who was sitting next to me, or he heard me make some kind of about, well, that's really odd. And he started looking at trace routes. And if you're really interested in this, you can uh, go through and look at all these trace routes. Um, he then drew this fabulous picture, which showed that we're seeing strangely asymmetric paths for this data. So um, from the Princeton site, which is on the lower right, um, it, it connects to N-Wave and then to Internet 2. And then the path that we're seeing for some of this data, at least, it's going through Hong Kong through the two 10 gigs between um, over one of the paths that gets you to Guam, probably through Hawaii, but we weren't not a link that we were able that we were monitoring from Hong Kong up to Korea and then to the university. The return path, however, was going on the CreoNet Kisti link directly to Chicago and then on from there. So, which is the path we would have expected in the first place because that's a fully 100 gig path. So, some odd routing here. Why would you prefer 10 gig path as opposed to 100 gig path? I'm not sure. The next thing we decided to look at was, you know, there was this three sets of data transfers could we zoom in on those and get some more information about what's going on there? So I changed my time frame to the first one of those, which was about um, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. On, on over a couple uh, over one day. And the weird thing that we saw here is these transfers are happening roughly every five and at five minute intervals. So someone's running a cron job to transfer some data. And it's running for about 12 hours. I'm not sure why. So we decided, okay, well, let's look at one of the other time frames and saw pretty much the same thing. At five minute intervals, these transfers were taking place pretty regularly. Um, in this case, you know, that, that uh, last interval that was taking place just before I gave this talk originally in July, uh, 336 flows, the rate the performance varied quite a bit um, with a pretty long tail to the slow side. The volume varied. It had a it was mostly uh, about 250 to 300 meg um, and the duration could be all over the map and didn't map to the volume or the rate very well. So it was very kind of odd. So we posited, well, what would I do with this next? 
So if I were a known guy and looking at this data and I found this and, and I will say, seriously, we did not look for a weird example. This is just kind of happened. I would like to find out what's going on with that path. Um, is this the most effective path to use? Um, is, are the routes set up correctly, which is a whole nother talk. Um, Hans Adelman goes on and on about how nobody knows how to do BGP properly anymore. We find many, many routes that are just crazy bizarre. Um, it'd be really interesting to look at the performance that's going on. Are they getting the performance you'd expect? Why is there so much variance to it? It would be interesting to find out what the science is. You know, is there a reason that they're doing these every two weeks or so downloads of a, of a fair amount of data? Is that a collaboration we should be aware of? Is there something that NOAA could do to help that collaboration uh, move forward more effectively? So this is a common way that this tool has been being used recently. Um, it allows you to see the higher level patterns um, and to look at kind of the, the global view of it. Um, and then to zoom in on more details with the, the local tools that you have at your, your uh, fingertips if this is your institution. Um, so, we also get data from several other places that I'm going to walk through just quickly. Um, one is from the Science Archives. I mentioned that just briefly. Um, we use this tool called TSTAT. It's an open source piece of software out of Italy funded uh, through a number of European Union sources, which gets you flow data plus retransmits. We currently have this deployed at NERSC. Uh, TAC, University of Hawaii on one of their astronomy archives, at NOAA on a small backup archive, and we just recently got up and running uh, this on some of the NCAR Wyoming data sets as well. So again, this shows you the top flow data. So in this case, we were looking at the TAC data. Um, who were their top senders and top receivers? Okay. Um, you can also see uh, pairs, and in this case, you can see the retransmits. Um, as well, which has been really interesting. Uh, NERSC was our first guinea pig for this data set uh, when we got this up and running on the NERSC archives and every uh, pairing that had a large retransmit number they already knew about, which was kind of cool. Um, we also have interesting data just from SNMP. So everybody's seen an SNMP map. This is our variant of it for the Great Plains Network. James is probably on this call. Hey, James, this should look familiar. Um, if you scroll down on this page, you actually see uh, a little bit of data for each of the links on this. Um, this is live. The default for this is the last 24 hours. You can look at it over time and see how it flexes. Uh, but one of the other views we have, right, so you can see this is for each of the circuits. At the bottom, we see the, the graph that all of the network engineers love and all the biz guys hate. It's your standard bandwidth over time. We also have a heat map view. So, this is interesting because you can see patterns. So if you look at the third one down, Internet 2, Kansas City, really obvious day of the week pattern. That's kind of cool. Um, some of them, not so many patterns at all, um, and some of them are just odd, like this one net to GPN via the Internet 2 VLAN. Um, we have other dashboards. We can do flows by country. This is especially of interest to the international group. Um, so, for example, we work regularly with people in Africa because we'll find things like the data flows from the Nordic countries to Malawi go by way of New York. Historical route shouldn't be happening. We're trying to resolve that. Um, we have some data statistics as well. So that tells us how much data is available for, in this case, the international links, um, what's the uptime like, and so on. We also have some dashboards for Perfsonar. We have a map similar to the SNMP map, but we also have maps for loss and latency. These have been really useful to find things like uh, the Hong Kong to Guam link. We found a down peering because all of a sudden um, one of these uh, loss patterns shifted. And so something was going on and we needed to look at it. One of the other aspects that NetSage has spent time on is, is called the science registry. The product started by um, wanting to be able to inform NSF what types of science were running over the IRNC, the, the NSF-funded international links. Um, 
unlike when you use an HPC resource and you get an account and you tell the account, well, I'm a geologist and I have these grants and this is my home institution and all of this. When you use a network, you just use the network. Nobody knows if you're using their network. Um, you will be using the international links and have no idea um, that they are. So we uh, decided to uh, build the science registry similar to what Greg Cole had done with his Gloriad project, where when we ingest flow data and we, we have the full IP address, we tag it with ASN and organization. And if we know the science project and the science discipline for that IP range, then we can add that in. We wipe off the low order IP, put it in the NetSage archive. So we've been going through uh, mostly the international data, we currently have about 300 entries mapping IP ranges to particular science projects and science domains. Um, so this is one of the visualizations we have for that, um, which is the science type. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the source on one side, the destination on the other side, and the type of science down the middle. So this is called a Sankey graph. Um, we're in the process of updating uh, the science registry. We've done a, a stricter mapping of the science disciplines. Um, basically to the NSF directorates. We've been adding in data from talk talkers, and most of the time we have to work with third parties for that. Um, NetSage doesn't have the IP addresses by the time the data gets to us, so we need to work with the people who do have them to know what those ranges are like. Um, we also have a heat map view of that data, which is kind of interesting. Our thought there was maybe certain types of science would uh, have patterns over time, for example, for uh, demonstrations or publication deadlines or such, we're still playing around with that. Um, so what's coming up? Um, we've got a lot of data right now, and every time we play with these dashboards, people ask more questions. Um, so one of the questions that comes up a bunch is you'll look at that initial uh, SNMP dashboard that we saw for GPN, and you'll see a spike on one of the circuits. So what, what's caused that spike? So we have a dashboard that should come out in the next few weeks where you can select part of that SNMP dashboard. It will then take you and show you the top pairs of toppers during that time frame uh, from the flow data. Um, the other uh, analysis that people would like is, you know, let me set my circuit that I'm interested in or my organization that I'm interested in. Who's moving a lot of data but getting really poor performance? So setting an endpoint, you know, set a minimum size for the, you know, the data must be at least this large and the transfer rate has to be at least this small. You know, can you give me a list of those so I know who I should talk to who's having problems? Um, but the development of new dashboards is fairly straightforward and it's really request driven. As we go around and talk to people and use these, we're, we're altering them and, and adapting them to meet those needs. Um, because we're really trying to focus this on what are the questions that people are asking for? You know, how can we answer the, the question you have of this data in another way? Um, the, the problem we have isn't that uh, there aren't enough questions. It's, it's almost that there are too many. And how can we present these in a way that are, are fairly intuitive? So what NetSage does best is it answers these questions by network engineers or network owners in a way that allows you to see these summaries and patterns in a human readable form. It can give you this higher level view that if you are a network owner, you can then dive into your own data to find out what might be happening at a very finer grain. Um, it's a simple way to make accessible this data. Um, it's useful to um, administrators and funding agencies as well. Um, so we've had numerous people say this is exactly the data that my CIO was asking me for last week, and I didn't have a way to tell him. So that's kind of cool. So in summary, NetSage is a tool that can help you understand data transfers. We're currently uh, deploying it domestically with the other EPIC regional partners. Um, we've got the international uh, set up as well. And we're in discussions with the Global NOC to find out if, if we can move forward and, and have them offer this as a managed service. So if you're interested in that, do let me know. Um, we're just starting that conversation. I think it's a really useful path forward. Um, and with that, I will take questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jen.
so if anybody does have questions and you want to uh, type them into the chat room, please do. Or if you're in a quiet area and want to unmute and ask them directly, uh, feel free to do so. I have a couple of uh, canned ones here, but I'll pause for a minute and see if anybody wants to ask any before I go. Uh, James has a comment. Um, make a community call to contribute to the science registry. Uh, so do you have any commentary on that? Right. So how to build the science registry is, is a really challenging problem. You're right. Um, there is no way to do it automatically through screen scraping or, or other ways. You're right. We really need to get the community involved in that. Uh, we're in the we're just doing this shift over of the domains and simplifying that form. Um, so as soon as that's done, uh, we will be able to, to do exactly as you suggest and try to reach out to some of these larger, especially the larger application groups and say, you know, if you have an IP range that your team is using, let us know about it. Give us the project name. You can give us some information about the project if you want, but that's the, the minimum data is an IP range and the name of a project and the science type. And we'll go forward. So I agree, James. That's a good approach. Okay. Uh, John Paul asks, is this a tool that is generally available for deployment? Right. So right now, this is running as a managed service for the partners of the two grants that are funding it, the International Networks team and the EPIC group with their six regional partners. We're talking with the Global Knock about um, enabling it as a managed service um, that you could work with them to have deployed for your system. Currently, it is not, it, while it is open source, um, it is not documented in a way that it would be straightforward to simply pick up the code and run with it. You're welcome to try. Actually, the PRP guys deployed the core bit of it on their Fiona network last year for supercomputing, um, but don't have the data collection piece running. Um, we, we haven't. Uh, done a close, close loop on that. Um, it's meant primarily to be run as managed service. Okay. Uh, so those are all the questions for right now. So uh, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, what is the data policy uh, surrounding some of the more sensitive information? That basically, imagine if I'm a CIO and, and I have concerns about that. So how, how, how does the project approach that? If you just want to give sort yeah. of an, an example of the discussion that you would have regarding that. That's a really good question and something that we thought about a lot when we were starting this up, especially in the international space where you've got different countries with different data privacy laws. Um, so we approach that in a, with, with a several prong approach. Um, one is that the full IP address, um, which depending on who you talk to is PII, um, is never in the NetSage archive. We never have that stored locally. Um, it is stored in a cache uh, before it goes through the data pipeline, but that cache is no more than 24 hours. Um, and that's not uh, something that the NetSage project has access to. Um, we also drop uh, the small messages. So we don't even have the headers for um, most email web pages, all of that. So we, we uh, have upped that threshold um, in part to, to get rid of that. Um, we worked pretty closely when GDRP came out in Europe to make sure that we were compliant with that. And uh, four different lawyers agreed that because um, we weren't uh, the finest granularity we have is at the ASN or the organization level. That, that we were clear for the GDRP regulations as well. Um, everything in the science registry is accessible online. Um, those IP addresses are never made public. Um, that range is just used for the lookup. Um, and so there's a website for the science registry, but it just tells you the project name and, and publicly accessible data. So this is actually something that was pretty important to us when we, when we put this in place. Thank you. Okay, I'll pause there for a minute and see if anybody else wants to type or ask anything. All right, I have uh, one more. Uh, so you had mentioned uh, TSTAT use on 
uh, data transfer nodes and uh, various systems that would be involved in the act of archiving or serving out data sets. What uh, sort of performance does that require? Uh, is it able to keep up with a 10 gig NIC, a 40 gig NIC, beyond? And uh, what, what are the overheads that are involved with uh, operating that on a machine that's probably already doing uh, a job of data archival or data serving? That's a really good question as well. So we actually have two different ways that we can deploy the TSAT data gathering. Um, what we did with NERSC is it, uh, they actually deployed the software on their uh, data head nodes. So if you look at the sensor list uh, for any of the archive data, it, it has six or seven different NERSCs that are listed because those are the different head nodes to get into their archive. They have not seen any interference in terms of load for the um, the, the load that they experience for the volume of data that they're experiencing. The other way that we can gather that data is we can have a splitter and we run it to a separate machine. Uh, the, the servers that we're currently using, we've had scale up to 35 or 40 gigs of, of data pretty easily. Um, we haven't had an environment to test it with uh, higher than that. Um, most of the 100 gig links that we were looking at were only used at about 35 to 40 gigs at most of the time, so that was enough. Um, if people are experiencing 100 gig flows into a data archive, uh, I actually think your problem is going to be the back end, not, not any of the software that we're putting in the front. Um, so as this grows, we'll have to keep an eye on it, but right now we've, we've had pretty good scalability. All right, uh, I'll take another quick pause here if anybody else has any questions that they want to throw in. All right, I think we may be at the end of the questions. Uh, so I will thank Jen again for the, the talk. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, the slides get posted so that everybody can see the URLs that she mentioned. And uh, I will post the, the video as well to the various locations. Uh, next week's talk is going to be me. And I'm going to be talking about uh, one of the events that's going to be occurring at the CC Star PI meeting uh, that's going to be held in September in Minneapolis. It's going to be uh, uh, related to data transfer. Uh, it's going to be a, a workshop and a uh, community challenge that we're going to start to issue for people to test out and verify their data movement infrastructure and hopefully improve it. Uh, so tune in next week if you want to hear a little bit about that. So I uh, hope everybody has a good weekend. Uh, thanks for joining, and we'll talk to everybody next week. Thank you.